Welcome to ClueCon Weekly. Join us every Wednesday to learn about the latest cutting edge developments in the real time communications industry. ClueCon Weekly is brought to you by Free Switch Solutions. Get support and professional services directly from the creators of the Free Switch open source project, solving your issues in the most efficient, stable, and scalable way possible. Get the Free Switch advantage. Visit freeswitch.com. Also brought to you by ClueCon, the premier technology conference for developers by developers. Join us every summer in Chicago. ClueCon kicks off on Monday with our annual hackathon, The Coder Games, followed by three days of technology-rich presentations discussing telecom, WebRTC, and IoT from developers around the world. To learn more, visit ClueCon.com or call 877-74-A-CLUE. Hey, and welcome to ClueCon Weekly. Today is the 13th of February, 2019. And this week, we're going to be joined by Dan Bogos from CG Rates. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with CG Rates, it is a uh, it is a uh, rating and billing package and routing package for FreeSwitch. Uh, OpenShift, Comma, Elio, and a whole bunch of other stuff. It works uh, really well. Uh, Dan and his team over there have been uh, making a lot of upgrades to it. So he's going to be showing off some really cool new features today. Um, got a, I've had a little preview of that, so it's just going to come in with scalability and uh, data handling and all kinds of cool stuff. So... Uh, Stand by for that. Uh, first, let's go over and see Miss Abby for the news. Hi, everybody. And as always, thank you for joining us today on ClueCon Weekly. So my biggest news of the day is that there are only 172 more days until ClueCon. And here is everything you know in order to get ready for that. So our early bird price of $5.99 ends on Friday, this Friday at midnight. So if you want to register for ClueCon at the lowest price you could possibly get, I definitely suggest going to our website and registering right now so that you could uh, hop on that amazing deal. Uh, if you are interested in speaking at ClueCon, our speaking proposals close on April 15th. Uh, you could submit a speaking proposal on our website if you go to speakers and then submit uh, a speaking proposal. So that ends on April 15th. So you still have a little bit of time, but as we all know, the early bird gets the worm. So I uh, implore you to do that as quick as you can so that you don't forget about it because we would love to see you speak at ClueCon. If you are interested in sponsoring ClueCon, we do have a few openings left. So don't worry if you were thinking about it, uh, we do still have some options open. Our Wednesday event that we always have, we are open to having another sponsor sponsor that. And we have a few other opportunities. This is a really great way to get your name out there and also show that you really support the open source community. So if you're interested in that, you can email Sharon at freeswitch.com for more information about sponsoring ClueCon. And if you are planning on attending ClueCon, I definitely uh, encourage you to arrive on Monday for the Coder Games. It's always a lot of fun and it's a really good opportunity to meet people before the conference. And this year we have a few surprises up our sleeve uh, because it is our 15th anniversary and not to spoil too much, but there will be a Mario Kart tournament. So that's just one thing. We have a lot of different programming challenges, a lot of different things you could build with your hands, uh, and a Mario Kart tournament. So why wouldn't you want to join us for that? All right. So now that I've told you some news about ClueCon, I'm going to go just straight into my blog spot today and tell you guys a little bit of some industry news. Uh, last week, we talked about how video conferencing, or in our newsletter, if you follow our newsletter, I talked a little bit about how video conferencing is becoming more and more popular when it comes to communicating with customers. And today, I'm just going to be touching a little bit on how texting is actually becoming a, a really good way to communicate with customers. Uh, emailing, uh, emailing is still a great way to communicate, of course, but other traditional methods that people are used to have definitely fallen by the wayside. Paper mail gets thrown in the trash without looking at it. Phone calls from unknown numbers are often rejected. I know I often reject them. I don't want to risk getting spammed or scammed. Uh, but text messaging has been found to be an immediate and effective way to communicate directly with customers. So some stats on that is that the average American actually checks their phone 47 times a day. 
and they open 98% of text messages. So similar to email, audiences need to opt into SMS campaigns, but if the content that you're offering is compelling enough, it can be a very, very productive way to communicate deals and other pertinent information. Uh, SMS campaigns can be set up pretty quickly with a, with a lot of different methods. Of course, SignalWire being one of them, we have very disruptive pricing, as you all very much well know, but people have found that this has been uh, a good way to communicate with customers because it's a source that people trust rather than you know answering phone calls from people they don't know. When it's a text message, they know exactly what you want, exactly what they're getting immediately and they don't have to spend a lot of time or effort reading it or going through it. So uh, statistics are showing that that's becoming more and more popular in ways of communicating with your customers. Uh, so that's all I have for my blog spot today. Check back next week. I will be talking about our free switch Klucon 10 year challenge. So I'll be back next Wednesday. And for now we are going straight into the community corner with Jersey Mike. Thanks guys. Thank you, Abby. So today we have a question for Ken. And the question came from the free switch mailing, the free switch users mailing list from Kadawan. Kadawan asks, hi, we are encountering the following DTMF issue. Free switch ads telephone, telephone event support in the invite to the SBC. The SBC replies back without telephone event support in 200. However, FreeSwitch still sends out DTMF in RFC 2833 event. I think FreeSwitch should send out DTMF in band instead of 2833 event. What's the configuration for this? Many help and thanks. So Ken, what are we doing here? Okay, so basically uh, for, for those guys that don't know, uh, 2833 is a mechanism for sending DTMF uh, without actually putting the tones down the line uh, or, you know, encoding the tones into your audio stream. Uh, the reason for that is, is um, unless you're using, say, G711 or a wider band codec like G722 or Opus, the coders, the way they work, uh, there's not enough bandwidth in there to really support the DTMF tones. They, they mangle it uh, so the DTMF detectors don't work. Uh, so in this case, what he's talking about is the RT... Uh, on your M audio line, you'll uh, you'll see uh, a number there, and then down below you'll see your RTM uh, your RTP map, and you'll see telephone event, and that's how we indicate twenty eight thirty three. In this case, his uh, his SB his SBC is uh, you know requesting uh, you know without is saying two hundred okay, but without the telephone event, so it's saying I don't really support twenty eight thirty three. So in this case, uh, what's happening here is uh, free switch uh, is is not going into in-band mode, and that's because you have to tell FreeSwitch to go into in-band mode. So the way you uh, the way you have to do that is uh, on the uh, there's a couple of different things that you want to look at on that. One is what's the DTMF type you're using on your Sophia profile that it's going out, and that has one of three settings. That's uh, info, which is actually used in a ship info message for transmitting the DTMF. The other is RF, uh, RFC 2833, which is the default method, and in my opinion, the best method. And the third setting for that is none. Now, if you set it to none, FreeSwitch is just not going to transmit uh, info or 2833. But FreeSwitch is not going to automatically translate 2833 to in-band or in-band to 2833. Um, you have to, uh, there's a couple of dial plane commands you need. So in this case, in, mm -hmm. in another part of the message, he's actually, he has it set to, to none. Uh, so, well, if he had it set to none, so he still needs to uh, enable the translation mechanism for DTMF. Uh, FreeSwitch uh, can do several different things with DTMF. Uh, one of the things it does by default is clean up 2833 because, unfortunately, uh, you know, it's you want to send strict, but you got to receive anything. So there's a setting for that. Um, in this case, translating so from liberal DTMF, right? Say that again? That's the liberal DTMF setting? Uh, no, there's a different setting. Uh, that's uh, although liberal DTMF uh, could work in this. Uh, that's another setting on uh, that you can set on your profile, which is uh, your parameter name is liberal DTMF. Set that to true, and then what that causes FreeSwitch to do is send both 2833 
and uh, or excuse me to accept both 2833 and info um that that uh is not yet necessarily recommended for use but it's there to uh you know deal with buggy uh sip implementations because there's some out there that'll say in the sdp they'll say hey uh we're gonna send a telephone event but they turn around and send you info or they say they're sending info and then they turn around and send you 2833 anyway um or they don't indicate 2833 or info at all. Uh, so you're supposed to go to in band, but they still send you one or the other. So um, right. that's for that. Now in the dial plan though, there's two commands that you want to be aware of. One is generate DTMF. And that is for taking 2833 and turning that into tones in band. Um, the other one is detect, uh, uh, is detect DTMF. That takes the in band tones and then turns that into the events that free switch needs. Uh, for doing things like uh, driving IVRs, uh, generating 2833 uh, DTMF, or generating info DTMF. And so in this situation, what he probably needs to do is, is turn on the DTMF detector in his dial plan, and then allow that to, uh, or excuse me, the DTMF generator in his dial plan. So it'll translate the 2833 into tones in band, and then set his DTMF type uh, on that outbound leg for that SBC uh, to none, so it's not trying to, you know, send 2833. Um, in this case, that's there's some manual interaction that has to be done there, and it's not completely automatic. Uh, but uh, it, it's fairly straightforward. And uh, if you uh, check out uh, Confluence and you look for the Sophia configuration page on there, there's a whole section about DTMF and how you can uh, and the various settings you can do. Um, and if you, if you run into DTMF issues, there's one more uh, setting that you can do. So if you have, uh, we've ran into this in the past with uh, certain uh, SBC vendors where they don't like the DTMF that FreeSwitch sends, but they'll take uh, any old random crap. Uh, so there's actually another setting that you can, uh, that you can uh, set either uh, in the dial plan as a channel variable or uh, on your set profile. It is pass-RSG 2833. And this is one of those no device left behind type uh, features. And what it'll do is it won't, free switch won't regenerate the DTMF. Uh, if you set that, it'll just take whatever it gets in on the inbound leg and send that straight to the outbound leg. Just copy it across the bridge. Um, so and so that, and so that, so that manufacturer you're talking about, it starts with the big S, right? Um, let's see here. It very well may be, um, I, but they, they, that was I, I think they've fixed it up they, they've fixed that up in the past couple well, of years uh, that, uh, that that particular vendor that if I recall correctly because that feature has been in there for many many years now I mean I think yeah. that was added eight or nine years ago uh, there was a there was a vendor uh, and I can't think of their name right off the top of my head but they're a large vendor that uh, some of the big guys were using or still are using. And they had a bug in their DTMF detector when you sent them 2833. It would cause the DTMF detector to hard lock on the channel. And it wouldn't unlock until you got a re-invite or until you hung up and called back again. Um, and wow. So it, and it was just the way that they parsed the 2833 messages. Um, I believe that's been fixed, so there's not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, a need for that anymore for that particular vendor. But um, as... You know, we learned uh, with dealing with the internet, you need to accept anything. And yeah. I mean, literally, you you receive loose and you send strict on the specs. And if you do that, that makes you as compatible as uh, with the, as number of people as you can. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of people want to receive strict, and uh, they may or may not be interpreting the uh, the RFCs the same way that I might interpret them. Or even me and you, Mike, could argue about an interpretation on how it's written. Because there's a lot of maze and a lot of cans, and then there's some must. But there's a lot of, eh, well, you could do this if you want to, but, you know, it's not a hard requirement in the RFC. So, well, what we want to do is have as little tickets open as possible. That's what it comes down to. Exactly. <laughs> features all over FreeSwitch uh, for addressing some of this stuff. Uh, and you'll see some... Um, Occasionally, you'll see a log line that says something about, okay, this is for Cisco support, or this is for Sansei, or this is for, uh, you know, insert other vendor here. Um, it's because they do something a little bit different and uh, not necessarily the way that we interpret it. So 
uh, you know, for compatibility reasons, Tony, Mike, Ryan, the rest of the uh, development team have implemented workarounds for some of that stuff or, you know, made it uh, where we'll send a little bit uh, loose on the spec to make it work. So uh, it's in there. Uh, search around Confluence. And also when you run into stuff like this, a big hint is uh, go to Google and use the site colon, uh, you know, Google modifier and do list.freeswitch.org. And it'll actually search the mailing list for you and restrict it down to that. You may, uh, some of these features find have been around. There, for sure. Yeah, yeah. You may find an answer there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Ken. All right. Um, answers from the experts. And cool. now, today we have Dan Bogos from CG Rates. Hey, Dan, how you doing today? Hey, Michael. Hi, Ken. Hi, Abby. Hello, everybody. So I'm, I'm doing great. I'm honored to be here. I'm one of your, your regular uh, watchers on the YouTube channel. So I'm proud to be uh, today here to, to talk about uh, our open source project. Well, it's it, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Uh, you come on semi regularly, which is great, and I love seeing you in person. So, you know, you. he's Same he here. travels around the world in a very, on a regular basis and goes to all the shows. And you know, if you got any questions, he's the guy to ask when it comes to his platform. <laughs> so, you were saying that there's been a lot of changes recently. Well, um, like uh, I think every year, uh, we, we, we do this project out of passion. So we are really uh, pushing uh, a lot of code uh, in, the, uh, in the repository. And I hope we uh, got to a point where we, where we finalize the, uh, the architecture and we start uh, thinking about uh, having that long waited by us as well release with so, so uh, yeah, I think it's it's wonderful. And, and and so I think you're one of the people that got me hooked on Go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I I I I'm um, one of the passion developers in Go. Since I started with Go, I, I stopped doing everything else. So that that shows how um, addicted I am to Go. <laughs> it, it, it's a great language, that's for sure. Yeah, I agree. So what are some of the new features you that you're working on and that you've recently released? Well, um, we have uh, recently pushed in, into the repository in our master, a new feature, which I came today also to talk about is the dispatcher. Um, this dispatcher is sort of uh, a balancer. We call it dispatcher because it, it does this uh, uh, dispatching functionality. We try different names. It's always hard to find new. So uh, it's whether you want to call it uh, load balancer, dispatcher, uh, failover, uh, anything you like to name it, it should uh, fit the purpose. So it's like a, a routing uh, for the APIs in the end. It's a routing component for the API calls. Okay, uh, so it's not it's not a, it's not a call dispatcher like Camille or Open Center. No, have. no, it's it's a simply a request dispatcher at at a message layer. So it receives the messages, the RPC messages, and it uh, transfers them to the right um, servers forward. So it also uh, behaves as. Um, a, co a standalone component. So I'll I'll show you some examples and. I got some slides today, so you can uh, maybe understand more by examples because uh, every time we do a new feature, it's kind of hard to uh, transpose it to the uh, public because uh, we are an API based billing system. So we don't have a, a fancy web interface, but all we do is uh, through APIs. So uh, I kind of uh, use lately the, the JSON uh, blobs just to show how how the APIs look like and the, the public and the people can uh, more easier understand them. Well, and that's great too, because what happens is each person that utilizes the platform, they, they, they can build their own custom unique GUI based on the APIs. Exactly. Well, that's our also our main purpose and uh, business model. So we sit behind as a back service, 
and we leave the, the uh, companies to, to have the freedom of building their own interface and their own product. So in the end, uh, it's not necessarily a must that their customer know what system runs behind because there will be uh, nothing displayed to the public. It will be all their own fingerprint. Yeah, because you will, your target your target audience is, is really like the super enterprise and carrier market. And so yeah, those guys, cool. they would never utilize a predefined GUI anyways. They would have something that would have to directly integrate into their own infrastructure. Yes. Uh, well, this, this was always what, what we, let's say, what we preach always, because people were asking us about the web interface. We said, yeah, web interface is wonderful, but even if we invest in building it, there are not many in the end which will use it because we are also, uh, let's call it geeks. So our web interface, I don't think will look like their professional designed and uh, like uh, following their uh, overall uh, product design, which they have on their side. So this is why we, we don't even uh, try it yet. It could be that later we, we do it, but as a proof of concept to give them an example how they should do it. So that's that's the plan behind it but we are still not there with the with the code so this is why we didn't do much steps towards api uh towards web interface yet okay so let's start okay great so if you can put my my slides on the board perfect i'll i'll just walk you through a bit i i have some ideas also for for newcomers who are not uh, aware about the project um so the company uh, paying uh, our salaries and bills and most importantly most importantly our um, uh, trips to Klukon to Chicago every year is located in in Germany so um, we we got over the years um, platforms implementations in both uh, wholesale as well as re retail business categories and we really consider ourselves understanding and taking seriously the system outages. So we, we are very careful with that and we understand what this means. Um, CG rates, uh, if uh, the people don't know it by now, it's a, a real-time enterprise billing suite. So it's, it's fully customizable. It has a lot of components. Um, some of them are uh, used in some businesses, some of them in some other businesses, but in the end, uh, you should be able to implement a lot of crazy ideas by uh, combining them. Uh, in theory, it should be pluggable into existing infrastructure, so it doesn't require you to redesign your, your existing infrastructure when you get it in. Um, it should be also uh, future-proof, so in the future, if you need to bring in a new equipment, you should be able to do that. And it should be non-intrusive. So we should not force you routing your traffic through a switch of our choice or anything else. We communicate with the switch. So we exchange information in, in the switch and the, the switch administration administrator has the, the freedom of choosing whether they follow our tips or not, because uh, we exchange uh, for example, with free switch, we exchange information through channel variables. So whether they use this in, in their dial plan or not, this is up to the uh, system administrator. Then the, the and, full and so software... you've done a lot of that. You you've already done a lot of that hard work for them too, because you have basically like secondary application examples, and you know the people can just look at that and almost instantly integrate. Yes, exactly. So uh, we are uh, we have published on our repositories a tutorial, and there we we have a full a free switch, just retested by the way with with your uh, default uh, stable one point eight uh, that was a few days ago. So it works uh, without problems, and uh, people can just try it and. Yeah, if they, they get trouble, then they should report it. But normally they have something to start with. And if um, not much, but they also can get the full picture about how they should configure both applications because both, both configurations and tariff plans are inside that folder. Cool. Yeah. So um, 
just continuing the the whole uh, software it's it's the full software it's uh, available as uh, open source so we don't have any add-ons in private repositories so this should matter because um, for us uh, this is uh, means quality of service because our sources can be always looked by uh, uh, our uh, or uh, viewed by the community members so it, it always helps to have more people looking into them from, from the point of view of security problems or uh, features and so on so um, we, we really have uh, like we said a consideration for community contributors then uh, it's a, a performance oriented software uh, be, uh, our most uh, the best kept secret would be uh, our caching system it's, it's very uh, configurable and powerful uh, it's transactional it, it has lru support like this uh, it's always keeps the hot data in into cache and also it's able to expire on timeout so if you get like uh, destinations um, loading in the cache, they can also expire in a few hours or one day. For example, if you are doing number portability lookups and so on, so you make sure that you refresh your number portability after a while. So, then, so LR, the LRU cache is essentially like a hash table, right? Uh, like, can you repeat? Sorry? It's, it's in memory store, like a hash table. Yes, exactly. So um, it's it's a bit more complex than that. Uh, we use uh, various mechanisms. Um, to, to obtain the caching, but it's a it's a sweet uh, a, a, a hash of hash maps because we have um, what we call cache partitioning. So each um, object category will be stored in another cache partition. So when you uh, you can count them, you ha you can have stats for them, you can uh, refresh this cache and so on. So it's um, it's uh, quite uh, flexible if we if you do it in that way. I know, and all that data is available via API calls and stuff, right? Exactly, including cool. uh, the full cache overview. You can uh, query it via this uh, cache APIs. You can also pre-cache. So you start with the server um, like uh, fresh, and then you decide which uh, objects you want to pre-cache. So you warm up your data at the, at the start time. Uh, if not, then uh, if you don't use pre-caching, then the data will be cached dynamically. So when it's needed, but also this process is pretty fast because uh, we use uh, something like Redis, uh, which you know some others are using as a cache. We use it as a as a, a database by purely means because we need faster processing than Redis can offer. With Redis, every query it goes into this serialization over network and this adds delay. We don't want to do that. So from milliseconds, which uh, the network offers, we get into nanoseconds, which, which our cache offers us. So this is why we say uh, it's it's way faster because the data, it's, it's, uh, it's dynamically cached and it stays there until you decide that you want to take it out or you configure it. Well, that's cool. So you're out. removing the syscalls and all that. Yeah. Yeah, so then um, the, the whole thing, uh, it's, it's very hard to block it because it's all asynchronous. So each request will be treated into in its own, uh, what we call micro thread or go routine. So um, then by if you get any kind of that log, you get only for one call, not for all of them. So um, we also have some, uh, of course, that that log should never happen. But if by by chance they happen, we have mechanisms to auto recover from dead logs. Then, um, the, yeah, it's 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 a lot of uh, code behind. I strongly encourage you, especially that you now go now, uh, to have a look because it's it's a lot of problems which are general in software which were solved uh, in the code. Uh, if you remember, we were we were one of the early adopters of Go. So when we started in uh, 2010, Go was in weekly release stage. So it was not even stable yet, and we grew practically together with Go. Uh, we were lucky because we started. So it's like a love hate with... relationship, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was it was really really cool decision. 
actually the the whole decision was uh, of my partner uh, by that time he he was uh, having this talent of picking the, the new languages and it was a good pick um, and also uh, the secret why we can run it with with um, a small development team is because we ha we have a lot of tests so we have more than 5000 tests as part of our test suite and many of them are run as uh, test units, some of them as integration tests, and then some other are uh, doing uh, real calls. For example, we have uh, PJ Sua, which we use the library. We, ha we have written a wrapper on top of that, and we do real calls to emulate calls through FreeSwitch, for example, just to make sure every time we want to, to make sure that we are still compatible with FreeSwitch and everything is okay, we just start running these uh, calls because uh, we, we started supporting more and more uh, platforms and then we don't need to, to start installing everything and setting up uh, all this stuff uh, every time we want to test. That's important. That's cool. Yeah, of course. And um, it's uh, modular, so it should be cloud ready. Uh, it's, it's, it's built on microservices with rich uh, set of APIs. I, I don't know if, if we don't have uh, maybe hundreds of APIs. I never counted, but I should do at some point. Uh, but there are many. So you will be impressed if you go on our GitHub and go on the bottom of the page, you'll find there the link towards our APIs. And these are uh, extracted in a Go doc uh, automatically from the sources and it's uh, due to that it's easy to enhance by rewriting specific components so if you're not happy with any of our components for example you want to take out cdr server you simply take it out place in your own cdr server with your own code so you don't uh, you are not anymore affected by gpl because you are communicating over apis with our software so you can simply replace any component which you which you like and make it your own. Then uh, it's the, the software itself is feature rich. Uh, we, we got any crazy idea which we could think of. Uh, we are what others are calling online charging system. We are also offline charging system, uh, multi-tenant. So if you want to build uh, platform partitioning and uh, what let's say Google is doing with their uh, Google apps or Google suite, you can do that. Um, first component was the rating engine where we have what we call derived charging ability to to uh, fork sessions and cdr so you get one cdr and then you can rate it against your supplier pricing your your distributor pricing your your customer pricing and so on so you can do unlimited number of charges on or billing runs on the same CDR. The, and the same happens for sessions. So if you have, you can emulate sessions for both distributor and their customers. And if the distributor or their customer is running out of credit, the call will cut. Uh, then we, we also support a number rating. So you charge per destination, but also based on who is the, where is the caller located. Uh, this was some hunted functionality a while ago in Europe. Then uh, we support account ban balances. So what others are, are calling bundles, um, you can have unlimited number of combinations of minutes per destination, SMS, uh, special price per minutes and so on. Then we do a session or event charging with balance reservation. And that and works refunds. with triggers too. So like, let's say you wanted to create a bundle that like where the customer gets like a thousand minutes and it's at this rate and then after you know, after the next thousand, it's discounted like 5% or something. You can do that. Yes, exactly. This is what, what we call uh, volume uh, discounts. So you can uh, order your, your balances based on your, your own uh, preferences on priorities. So uh, as soon as uh, a balance ends up, then it goes into another. Another one can have different prices. Uh, follow them. Sorry, I had the internet glitch, I think, because for some seconds the, the image dropped. Then um, 
you simply put the contracts inside and the volume discounts happen automatically. Let's say I have like a new customer sign up and they automatically sign up on the website and they start sending me like really bad short duration calls. Stuff like that can be auto detected, right? Yes, uh, we, we have another component which we call a resource cater controller. And this one can count the number of uh, calls per second. And you can combine it with uh, short duration calls detection because uh, these are uh, events which are sent to the thresholds uh, subsystem. That's another subsystem of ours. And these thresholds can count the number of calls with a duration lower than X on the destination Y. And then uh, it can alert you if, uh, if you get into these uh, cases. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, it's, um, you can use the thresholds also to, to do fraud detection and it can do automatic mitigation for you. So if you detect the fraud, then you can shut down the account as it happens in real time. Then um, so if someone's like international usage all of a sudden increases by like a thousand times, it's detected. Yes. So uh, for, for the moment, you need to, to set thresholds. But we do plan adding uh, like pattern uh, learning, so close to, to machine learning, and that, that should do stuff automatically for you. Of course, there you should be able to set some thresholds as well, but um, not anymore like straight numbers. You, you, you can set thresholds based on uh, behavior. That's great. That's a great yeah. feature set. Yeah, uh, we, are, we are heading there, though. It's something we want to do. Uh, then LCR, uh, a lot of flexibility over there as well uh, with uh, quality-based LCR, then LCR over bundles. So you can have uh, minutes to some supplier available in, in weekend, for example, and the, the LCR can know about that. LCR with, with um, based on patterns. So you, you calculate the LCR based on ACD, which you had maybe yesterday by that time. So you don't need to always calculate one minute LCR, but maybe five minutes, 20 seconds LCR, and then find out your best suppliers for that. Call statistics, if you want this ASR, ACD, all this fancy stuff, it's, it's available fast, it's in memory, so it's all performant. Then uh, since IMS is a fancy thing, uh, especially here uh, around MVNOs, and MVNOs are uh, uh, a large percentage of our customers, uh, we do support diameter and radius uh, with uh, process templates, and that's, that makes our server implementation standard agnostic. And uh, then we have this uh, resource allocation controller, which I told you about, it can manage the channels for your customers or some other resources. Uh, Built-in high availability and dynamic partitioning support, which I will talk about today, and we are pretty agile in developing new features. Um, just about our code, you see, we, we started coming to Klucon exactly in this point in 2013, and we learned that if we come regularly, our code and functionality increases, so we came ever since every year. <laughs> because <laughs> That's a good graph. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it's, it's a fact. So you see that exactly in, in 2013, in August, when we started coming to Klucon first time, then our code base started increasing. <laughs> so it was a, a good exposure. <laughs> and it's always, it's always great to see you there. I, yeah. I very much look forward to it. Same there. Same here. Uh, and then uh, we have here like a diagram of functionality. It's, it's more, way more uh, complex behind, but uh, like a, a snapshot of that, uh, you have uh, the, the interfaces outside, whether it's diameter, radius, asterisk agent, free switch agent, Camelio agent, or built-in module within OpenSIP software. They all talk to our uh, sessions uh, component, which is managing sessions. And this, by the end of the session, will uh, produce a CDR. And this CDR can also be received from other sources 
or other types of CDRs, whether they are CSV, XML, fixed width value, or in case of free switch for real time, we, we do this uh, JSON CDRs. We get them into CDR server and then we can uh, store it or directly export it. So once we calculate the CDR, we don't need to store it. It's an optional functionality on our side. We can directly export to, towards your uh, system, whether it's, it's via HTTP or uh, AMQP. We also support uh, lately uh, SQS for, on Amazon. So you can get the CDR in within milliseconds from your switch, from your free switch, for example, already rated. And it, you get it with uh, performance. So you get it in a, in a, a MQP, in a RabbitMQ or Amazon Q, and then you can pro, uh, process it from there. So in a few milliseconds, you have it rated and you can display it on your website and store it uh, in the, I don't know, database of your choice, where you also do it today to integrate it your, with your existing billing. So you don't need to do uh, many architectural changes on your side, as I told you be as non-intrusive as possible and then so the, so the, so uh, the fix the, the fixed width values that's that's the ATIS OBIF format right where it's a, it's direct uh, output from from the tandem equipment <laughs> it's got all the spaces with the zeros <laughs> yes well yes it could be um I know uh BT in, in UK, it's some uh, fan of uh, fixed width value. Also KPN, I think, in Netherlands. I don't know how it's there in, in US, but here I, I know more uh, the market over here. So uh, it's it's like like you said, it, they are uh, text uh, files and they are not separated in any way, but based on index. So you access the values based on index in the file. I, years ago, I, I I wrote something in Perl which parses that. <laughs> okay, so you don't really go. They, they they do use it in the U.S. It 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 it's so infrequent that you ever see it. It it. it... I can imagine, yeah. But here there are big imported carriers using it, so we need to to have that implemented. We are also going oh, yeah. for the tap. Tap is something spe uh, specific more towards uh, mobile networks. Uh, and there are switches which they they only export via tap. For example, one would be the, the big Nokia switches. They, they only do, want to do tap files uh, or uh, diameter events. So uh, these two things, but they have components which they don't communicate with, with diameter and uh, you need tap for that. And then um, there are other modules which you can use, as I told you, stats, resources, thresholds, so they can all receive CDRs, attributes, which is kind of our internal database, which you can again use via APIs. Uh, as online charging system, uh, this is just a, uh, an overview how you can um, like uh, use CG rates. This is one, one case of using. So, um, use the rating of CG rates like balances. You, you can you have voice data, SMS, MMS, monetary, including generic. Generic is a way of combining all of them. So you can say, I have, uh, let's say, bit, uh, bitcoins. It can be our generic balance. And then when you get minutes of data, you can um, configure there the, the exchange rate between uh, voice and generic. And also when you get SMSs, you can configure as well. So you can tell one minute of voice, it's equivalent of one generic unit. One SMS is also equivalent of one generic unit. So you can have a balance, which is common for everything. And depending who, where is the source coming from, you consume out of generic. Uh, so I, I know carriers having this kind of offers here in Europe. Um, then we do concurrent session handling with balance reservations in chunks of debit interval. We do balance refunds and also debit slips. So if we are configured to debit every five seconds and uh, the, the customer is charged per minute, then we can stop uh, for uh, a number of seconds, slip, and then start again because after one minute, start charging again and so on. And, and so this uh, is all maintained you, in the LRU cache. So 
you don't have to worry about massive database writes. Yeah, I, you don't. It should be uh, performant, and it doesn't eat that much of a of a memory. So it's it's all in the range of a normal installation should be something like uh, I don't know four to eight uh, gigs of RAM, which is uh, even even in my uh, phone I have more. I think. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it should be a fairly uh, f uh, use, uh, resource friendly. You can run on a $5 Amazon instance. <laughs> or whatever, yeah. So I, you know, it's, it's so funny because I hear more and more uh, people asking us going towards Amazon. So everybody's going there. So this is why we, we are also uh, implementing more and more uh, plugins towards Amazon infrastructure. Um, in terms of CG rates and free switch integration, uh, we we can behave like a module of free switch via uh, ESL. So um, we we have for that our uh, uh, Go module uh, MIT license to be fully compatible with with free switch licensing, uh, which you can fork and use it. It's 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 running in production since years, so it should be stable. Uh, it's uh, pretty uh, feature rich and mature. So uh, you just uh, take it and use it, especially you uh, with your uh, ghost kills. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, uh, we have um, connection pool for uh, increasing uh, performance. We have also uh, BG API support for async. We have recently added uh, we, we are using Park application for authorizing fa uh, requests. So when the request comes in, we put it in Park and we let CG rates process it and decide whether the call can go through or not. And we unpark it, passing back into the dial plan, and then it should next time uh, pass Park and just uh, go for normal routing. So it's it's pretty uh, secure. And uh, FreeSwitch, uh, by the way, is doing a great job there. It's it's very wisely built. This park, uh, I, we, we love it. And it's uh, we have bi-directional communication with FreeSwitch, so we kill the calls from outside when when we detect uh, like fraud or uh, balance uh, uh, exhaustion or something. Uh, we we can kill the calls and control them from outside. We also sync the calls, so if by any chance we have missed a, a hang-up event or free switch did not send it, or I don't know, it, this happens, but uh, like uh, a case we are analyzing, um, we can uh, synchronize and find out that our sessions are not the sessions in free switch, and then we can force this connection of the session which we have and it's tail. So, uh, and you can configure that with timers like every a couple of minutes to sync the sessions with free switch and uh, detect these tail calls. Uh, you can have a real time CDR monitor via uh, mod JSON CDR. And you can also uh, add as many uh, fields in your CDRs as you like. Uh, you can configure that. And we also support offline CDR processing via your CSVs or your XML, sorry, CDRs. Uh, dispatchers. Um, this is uh, the, the, the new model which uh, came on our site. So it's remotely accessible through APIs fully. Uh, it's uh, a transparent implementation of RPC methods for the supported subsystem. So what we do, we, we allow the, because our components communicate between themselves via APIs, and we allow the components to communicate over the same APIs with the dispatcher. So if you have a production service and you see a bottleneck or you see that you would like to fine tune a bit the, how you split the request, for example, the requests which are going for the, the CDR server, you decide that you want some CDRs to be sent to another CDR server, and that's in real time. All what you need to do is replace our CDR server with a dispatcher. Dispatcher will say, yes, I'm a CDR server and will forward back or will dispatch to other CDR servers which are behind him. 
So uh, this makes you uh, ability to scale as you need it. Of course, uh, not your case because you are with Amazon, so that should not be needed. But uh, Dispatcher has also another important part or functionality. It can route the requests uh, based on your uh, geographical needs. Uh, you know, privacy, this is an important topic in, in Europe with this GDPR or uh, in, in, uh, on your side in US, I'm sure you have also privacy concerns. So you can say this customer, I have a, a multi-site company, I have multi-region company, maybe let's say it, uh, some uh, company in uh, Europe, some company in US, and then I want that my customers in uh, Europe should host their data there and the data of my customers should not reach uh, US and this happens. Uh, the dispatcher come in hand can come in handy there as well, because it's able to to take these decisions for you. Um, it's uh, what we call a request router, so um, it it has ability to generically filter events. So it's you can see an event as a hash map with dynamic type fields, and we can put filters on any kind of um, fields and then uh, you can have any number of hosts behind it. And then you can have failover and uh, various things behind. Then you have uh, routing strat strategies. So you can route based on what we have today is weight, but we plan in the next days to add the random uh, routing as well as uh, load-based routing. So you can say a percentage of my traffic goes to uh, some of the uh, of CDR server and another percentage goes to another or to, to one rater or another. Uh, Dispatcher also implements API security. It's using uh, attributes as a data provider. It's using API key to uh, authenticate the request. And also there is one, one more particularity, API methods. So your API key can have right to, to a specific tenant and can have right to specific API methods. So if you are giving out APIs to your customers, you can control which API methods they are uh, able to access via this uh, functionality. Then um, it's, uh, this, this router is also able to, to cache the routing. So you can add an optional route ID header to your request. And then only the first request is dynamically routed. All the others are following the path which the first route ID has discovered. So you can make sure that this makes also faster. And also, uh, for example, you can make sure that one account, it's always hitting the same rater. So you don't get concurrency over uh, various processes, listening uh, or reading from the database or overwriting the database. That, that's, that's very good to make sure that, they, that the information doesn't go stale, you know, right? Because it, it's much easier when, you, when you're dealing uh, you know, with synchronization of data sources across data centers, if you keep on writing to the same source, if you give the, the information becomes reliable yes so uh, you can make sure that you go always over the same path as soon as you have discovered it um, just some some example of how we do it so there will be of course that you enable the dispatcher uh, service then you configure its connection to uh, these attributes which is for authorization and then you configure all of your generic connections. You add there all of your hosts with uh, grouped based on uh, failover abilities. So we always route to a host ID. This, is, this would be the, the one which you uh, define it uh, first. And then uh, based on that, we, we will always route to the same to the first host in the in the configuration and if that is not available we try the second one and you can have as many addresses of failover as you like and uh, in the dispatcher you can also configure failover there so you can then uh, go to other host groups and so on 
So this is the, the dispatcher configuration, which goes into some sort of uh, static configuration, which is loaded by the engine. So the engine, when, when the engine starts, it also does the, the connections to the first rows in the connection uh, configuration and in order to cache and make it faster, the dispatching later. And then everything else is configurable via uh, API. So for example, this is a, a, an API to configure a, a particular dispatcher profile. Uh, for example, this one will have access to some subsystems of ours and uh, have a filter for a, a full match on a field name zone and with the value US. So that um, also can be active for a specific interval. For example, this one will be active for the March, uh, for the month of March. And you know that you have your contracts and you only want to have it in March, then you can uh, configure the activation interval. If you don't configure, it will be always active, but you, you can fine tuning whether you put only activation time or only expiry time. And then the strategy for dispatching and then the connections. So you see here you have host one with a higher priority. We are talking about weight based dispatching. So host one will be the first one because it's higher priority and host two will be the second one because it's lower priority. Remember hosts are defined here in the host one and host two. And this can be also failover by, by themselves. And, uh, a process event will look like going to another subsystem. So this one looks like going to attributes, but it's passing to dispatcher. And here is where you can also configure your route ID and also your API key. So then this is the event, the event itself, which we route. And this event, for example, has account 1001 and a field name zone US which is then matching the, the filter, which I told you zone US. So you see, you can put any kind of dynamic filter you want because the events, they are generic. So you, you can send, uh, this can be your CDR or some other event which you send. And the, the reply will look like coming again from attributes because it's coming from an attribute service behind the dispatcher. So yeah, I, I've done it in the, in the half an hour. So <laughs> that's some cool stuff. That's for sure. If, if you fall asleep already, but <laughs> no, I don't think anyone will fall asleep with this. This stuff is like the most <laughs> interesting stuff in the world to me. <laughs> Thank you. So I don't know if you, if you have any kind of questions or your audience has questions. Uh, I'm I'm all yours. I I've I've rest my case. So, <laughs> okay. So with the so how does it how does how does it work between like distributed uh, like physically diverse distributed architecture? So can, can you uh, go deeper into that? What, what do you mean? So. Like, let's say you have a colo in Amsterdam and a colo in New York City. And so, you know, you have the paths and it's going to query the closest path, correct? Um, yeah. So it can be that you reach the closest uh, dispatcher via uh, DNS because you, you there are all sorts of uh, geo DNS providers and so on. Right. Geo DNS, and then um, you reach the our dispatcher, and then based on the the content of your event, you saw a header, a, any kind of header or something in the in your event, maybe your account or something. The dispatcher looks into its its rules, uh, routing rules, and will say, okay, this is a, a an account which belongs to uh, Amsterdam. We should forward it to the Amsterdam colo or uh, an, an account which belongs to US, so we should uh, forward it to New York Colo. Huh. And so what's, what's the consistency with it? Like, what is it, how, how, what's yeah. the type of latency? Well, they, they are strict rules. or, okay. And, and yeah, it's, it's instantaneous because uh, it's, uh, it has all the rules normally in, into a fast database or in the cache. 
So it's, it's fast in taking these decisions. Uh, we have tested, by the way, with, with our dynamic filters, we have tested with 20 million rules and it behave instantly, like a few milliseconds delay, deciding wow. and finding the, the right match based on, because we, we do a lot of indexing. Like I know, I, I know Redis, I agree, will have some issues with, with going long distances and spreading data around from like the master slave component. Yes. Um, so this we, is much more performant. Also then. Mongo, if you, if you uh, don't like uh, or you consider Redis will have troubles or something. And we, I think we will also implement at some point the Dynamo database of Amazon because people are asking for it. So maybe, let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Yeah, actually, uh, we do have uh, some questions from uh, YouTube. So, uh, okay. James, uh, so James Bodie, uh, and everybody knows hey, James. James. <laughs> He's watching on YouTube today. He asked, um, uh, he wants to know about diameter support. Yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we, we support it. It's one of, uh, of, of the oldest uh, modules in CGRAs nowadays, not oldest, but it's in, in production since four years now at some uh, important uh, MVNO here in um, Europe. They are running some picking, sometimes uh, 100,000 simultaneous sessions with only one uh, sessions manager on CGRA side, which is quite uh, impressive. And uh, they, they pick quite some number of requests per second as well, something like uh, 500 requests per second on New Year Eve. So it's, it's some serious traffic. So you can imagine that uh, this implementation should be stable enough if they run it without downtime, because if any minute the CG rates is down there, uh, they, they lose customers. So I would say, yes, Diameter is fully stable and is production ready, James. <laughs> yeah, cool. So, James, you should uh, go uh, install that. And then we have one, one more question here, Dan. Uh, yeah. And uh, June, uh, June, and I probably just murdered his name. He's asking, uh, is there any timeline for having ASN1 encoding, uh, decoding for CG rates? Um, I, I don't know 100% sure, but we have a, product, uh, a project which we should deliver. We hope uh, we will get that uh, around April, May. We already wow. started a bit working on that. You, you can find an issue on, on GitHub, subscribe to that and push it there. So just write inside and uh, tell us your opinions and maybe offer to help us with testing because we don't have access uh, always to all, all this uh, like uh, exotic for us uh, formats. Well, one, one of the great features of Go is it basically supports all the formats, right? All the yes. character sets and everything. It's just exactly. I, just I love that. It's, it's very only few occasions we needed to go and look for external libraries and also the mainstream, for example, all these databases like Mongo, Elasticsearch, everybody, they are doing now their own driver even. So they build and that, that guarantees us stability. And also um, we, we are uh, getting always the, the latest updates, which it's, it's nice. Right, and the best part is everyone you, when you compile the whole thing, it's, it's there in one big thing, you know, blob. <laughs> Exactly. One big binary. Yeah, and then you, you can move the binary all around your, you, you don't need to install anything, just copy one file, the binary around your, your Linux servers. You just need to, to keep the architecture and then you are all installed. Just run it. That's cool. Well, Dan, you should be really proud. I mean, it's a really cool project. It's a very, Thank very cool Thank you very cool much, project. Michael. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to have you as contributor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to sharpen my skills a little bit. That's for sure. I'm just new to go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but that, but I've written some stuff that what, like what really has helped me out a lot. Yeah, this is what we need the most. You saw we have something like two hundred thousand lines of code nowadays, so you can find 
a piece of everything. So from, from low to, to high level, you can get all sorts of problems to solve. Cool. Well, thank you for coming in today. Um, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much for, for having me, guys. And yeah, I, I hope we, we see definitely at Klucon again in, in summer. All right, back to you, Ken. All right, thank you very much, uh, Michael and Dan. Uh, great to have you on here again today, Dan. A lot of cool information there. So for you guys that want to know more about CG Rates, go to cgrates.org uh, and check it out. Uh, like Dan said, it's open source. You can get a copy of it and play with it yourself. They also have a lot of extensive information uh, over there on, uh, on uh, you know, getting it set up. So, uh, you know, check that out if it's uh, something that you guys can use. Uh, be sure you uh, check out Dan. Uh, you know, you can actually come out and meet Dan at ClueCon. Uh, Dan, uh, like you said, he's a regular there. You can also find him um, if you're going to uh, OpenSips uh, Summit, Comma Elio World, or probably even AstroCon. So, uh, he's a regular at these conferences because, that, like you said, it helps him uh, grow his platform. Uh, you can also find the FreeSwitch teams at these conferences, so uh, be sure to